A group of really great scientists created a film to kick off the fifth annual Global Food Security Conference happening in Belgium this week. When they asked me to be the voice, my first thought was, was this guy not available? The world was on fire and no one could save me but you. My second thought was, what about these guys? Mama called the doctor and the doctor said... No more monkeys jumping on the bed. Finally, he came to Ping. Ping hung his head in shame, expecting to be punished. The emperor asked him, Why did you bring an empty pot? Ping started to cry and replied, I planted the seed you gave me, and I watered it every day. But it didn't sprout. I had to bring an empty pot without a flower. It was the best I could do. Where you got your seeds from, I do not know. For the seeds I gave you had all been cooked. So it was impossible for any of them to grow. I admire Ping's great courage to appear before me with the empty truth. But seriously, these scientists are way above my pay grade when it comes to knowing how to raise food sustainably. To feed 10 billion people despite disruption from war and climate change and without turning our food into frankenfood. I have a strong background in earth science, but nowhere near their expertise in food production. However, I did make an important episode on the unbelievable story of how we figured out how to feed the masses by breeding huge wheat berries on dwarf stalks that were strong enough to support such large kernels. Not only did Norman Borlaug get a Nobel Prize for that and the highest honor many nations can bestow a foreign scientist, but there is a statue of him in the rotunda of the capital. Unfortunately, some people do have digestive issues with Norman's wheat, which they didn't have before with heritage wheats. I also made episodes on how modern breeding has turned beef into a frankenfood humans have never been exposed to, which is becoming more and more strongly associated with diabetes. So I salute these people who have the enormous mission of feeding 10 billion people without wrecking the planet or making us sick. Every one of us depends on them, so thank goodness they're so qualified and they care. Here's their film. They wrote the script and I had the easiest job of all. (laughs) Just flap my lips. By the year 2050, the world population will likely be close to 10 billion people. At the same time, climate change and other crises threaten food production. Will we be able to feed nearly 10 billion people under these conditions? And what will our food look like? First, let's have a look at how we currently use the Earth's surface. Let's reshuffle the land on Earth a bit to visualize this. About 70% of the surface consists of water. The remaining 30% is land. Not all land is habitable. 10% consists of glaciers and 19% is barren land. What remains is habitable land. Even though there are about 8 billion people on Earth, we only use 1% of habitable land for urban and built-up land. 11% is taken up by shrub, 37% by forest, and 51% by agriculture. That means about half our habitable land is taken up by agriculture. About two-thirds of agricultural land is used for grazing, while a third is cropland. We currently use this land to feed 8 billion people. To feed 10 billion in a similar way, we would need to produce 25% more calories. But diets are expected to change with economic development, which would make the amount of produced calories even higher. With current yields, that means we need much more habitable land to produce food. This would destroy vast areas of nature and with it, biodiversity, capacity to store carbon, and many other benefits. And land use is, unfortunately, not the only problem. Food production also requires fresh water, causes environmental pollution due to overuse of fertilizer, and contributes to climate change. Estimates vary, but greenhouse gas emissions coming from the food system account for about a quarter to a third of total emissions. 
And without changing the food system, it would likely be impossible to avoid 1.5 or 2 degrees of warming. At the same time, climate change also affects food production. Apart from the environmental issues, there is the aspect of human health. Many people currently don't have access to enough or diverse sources of food, causing stunting and wasting. About 30% of people are moderately or severely food insecure. On the other side of the spectrum, there's a large group that's eating too many calories, causing overweight, obesity, and diseases of affluence. Around 40% of all adults are either overweight or obese. All of this paints a pretty grim picture, but fortunately, there are solutions. First, we can improve yields. Historically, we were able to grow from 3 billion people in 1960 to almost 8 billion in 2020, with now more food available per person than in the 1960s, all while keeping the amount of cropland used relatively steady. That means we were able to produce more food on the same area of land. This picture does hide big regional differences, with arable land expansion in many low-income countries and a decrease in high-income countries. So, can we continue with this trend? Fortunately, there is still room for yield improvement in many places of the world, notably in Sub-Saharan Africa. This means agricultural expansion can at least be limited by improving yields. The second important element is what kind of food we eat. The environmental impact of food differs depending on the type of food that's produced. In general, animal products have much larger environmental impacts, including land requirements compared to plants. Because of the amount of land necessary to produce animal products, livestock production currently uses 77% of agricultural land. But these products only supply 18% of global calories. Conversely, 82% of calories come directly from plants while only taking up 23% of agricultural land. Most of the land used for livestock is grassland for cows and other ruminants. But crops such as cereals and soy are also grown specifically to feed animals. In high-income countries, most of the produced cereals are fed to animals. This process is inefficient because animals only convert a portion of their feed into meat, dairy, or eggs. Low-income countries can't afford this inefficiency and use most of their cereals for direct human consumption. Ideally, you would want to grow crops for direct human consumption and feed animals things like leftovers that are not suitable for human consumption. Or grass, where grassland is the desired ecosystem. This more circular food system would result in a large reduction of animal products in the diet, especially in high-income countries where high consumption of animal products is often the norm. Switching to environmentally friendly diets like pescatarian, vegetarian, vegan, or low meat could result in huge benefits to the planet. A strategic reduction of animal products could free up large amounts of agricultural land. Giving this area back to nature would result in massive benefits for the planet. Restoring nature is also a great way to battle climate change. Aside from what we eat, it also matters how much we eat. In high-income countries, average caloric intake is usually very high. Reducing excess caloric intake would therefore not only help the planet, but improve human health as well. Another important factor is food loss and waste. 24% of all calories produced are lost or wasted. In high-income countries, it's mainly from the plate. In low-income countries, it's mainly on the field and during transport and storage. And there are many other smaller issues that need to be addressed in the food system, such as the fact that some agricultural land is currently being used for the production of biofuels. When it comes to fixing the food system, there isn't a silver bullet. We need to combine many different solutions. But the most important step is moving towards food that is high yield, low impact. In some regions, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, the primary goal should be to increase food production on the same area by increasing yields. 
In other regions, such as Europe and North America, the primary goal should be to switch to more plant-based diets and more environmentally friendly ways of producing, and perhaps even use some of the current agricultural land for rewilding. So far, we've only looked at what's possible today. But innovations could also reshape the food landscape. When it comes to how we grow food, precision agriculture and innovations in aquaculture could further reduce the environmental impact of our food system. And when it comes to replacing animal sourced foods, precision fermentation and cultured meat are two potential solutions that could make a transition easier. Without action, the future looks grim. But with the right mindset and solutions, we can move towards a healthier planet that also supports a healthier population.